All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. Uh, Today is a special day. So for many of you guys that listen, you know that myself and my brother are massive, avid learners, always, always looking to enhance any area of life. And today I brought the preeminent public speaking guru onto the show. Not only is he going to teach you how to be an amazing public speaker, but he's going to tear apart one of my public speaking clips, which I'm super excited about and excited to learn. So first of all, Joe Williams, welcome to the show. Oh man, thank you so much for having me on. I, uh, I promise not to uh, tear you apart at all. In fact, you had some great stuff. So <laughs> looking forward to it, man. Awesome. Well, before we get started, for those of you guys watching this on video, um, you just have to tell them what's above your head behind you. Oh, right here? Yeah. The dude. <laughs> Big Lebowski. It is my reminder to kind of stay, you know, chilled out. I can tend to be a very intense guy. And so this is my reminder to uh, just kind of take a breath and just say F it, man. You know? It, it's so good. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, does he have like Jesus back there or something? But I'm like, it's not. So I ask, he's like, there's, I mean, I guess there's a Buddha, right? Yeah. There's a yeah. Buddha and I've got more over here, but yeah, no, no, no. Not quite so, uh, not quite so uh, mainstream and serious. Something a little more fun. So good. So good. And I love that next to it, it says, be a badass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such is the dichotomy of my life, I guess. Yeah, you actually took the word out of my mouth. Total dichotomy. Um, well, I mean, when we spoke previously, you know, one of the phrases that you said that I really, really liked and I wrote down was unlock your own unique style. Yeah. Something we speak a lot about here because I, I fully believe that when people are either starting to public speak or make presentations or are entrepreneurial in any way. It's this like, let me mold myself into that person because I think that that's who sounds good or that's who I like. So I'm going to be that person. Right. And um, I just love that you're kind of the anti version of that. So before we dive into the whole public speaking thing, I think it's really, really cool. Your, your past experiences, what you've been up to. So why don't you tell people about who you are, what you've been up to, and then we'll dive into all this stuff. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so I, you know, I, um, I'm not quite the uh, young man that I used to be. I was always the, the kid in the room, though, early on. I started really young in this whole world, whole world of not only personal development, but uh, professional development, business development, but also spiritual development. Mm-hmm. Um, I started going to teachers and, and, uh, and, and going to events and personal de- development events and things like that. I was about 18, 19 years old, I guess. When I was 20, uh, 21 actually, uh, Tony and I met. I had been to um, an event. I did attend. By the way, this is the Tony. The Tony, right, right. So Tony Robbins. Tony with the last name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, (laughs) Tone, as I call him. Um, And uh, so we met when I was like 21 and hit it off, actually became good friends. Uh, And that was really the early stages of my uh, development. I was doing stuff with him. I was doing all kinds of stuff outside of there. I had uh, different spiritual teachers teachers I followed from different uh, points in time, or at, I should say, different points in time. And um, then all along, there's been this thread of uh, entrepreneurship, business building, uh, and so forth. I had a, I was an investor in a telecom company in the early 90s, uh, in my early 20s, got lucky, made some money in my early 20s, and invested in a, a small long-distance reseller that we took public in 96 when I was 26 years old. Wow. Realized immediately I'd made a mistake. I am not cut out to sit behind a desk and you know run a company. I have incredible respect for those who do. And so I moved over into the world of uh, professional speaking and, and coaching, mentorship, mostly speaking, uh, really for the next 20 years. And um, that brings us kind of fast forward to where we are today. I also started teaching people how to speak, doing presentation skills and speaking events in uh, 2001. So I've been in the business now about 17 years. And, and you actually led Wealth Mastery for Tony yes, Robbins. Yes, I did for about 10 years. Um, it was a live event. It was not video based. And uh, I led it. I was the... Uh, the lead off uh, key speaker. There were others there who were specialists in, uh, or say, you know, stockbrokers, things like that. They taught the stock stuff. Real estate people taught the real estate strategies. 
small business entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, I should say, people taught that aspect of the uh, event. I taught the mindset of wealth creation, the, the mindset of abundance and prosperity. That was what I taught. Which is, I mean, Tony Robbins, let's just say, can kind of pick whoever the hell he wants to do any of his speaking events. Uh, yeah. So I'm sure it's an honor and privilege just to be it was. around him. Um, but so cool, or I should say, and so cool that you actually got to lead that for, you know, a decade plus. So that's absolutely, amazing. it was a ball. It was a ball. We had so much fun. And then I was also his head trainer for 10 years as well, from 2004 to 2014. I was head trainer of the organization. So yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Absolutely okay. brilliant. And so now the new passion is yeah. actually helping people unlock their unique style on stage, public speaking. So you tell me, how do we want to dive in? Cause, Oh, let me just give you guys a preface. So we were talking with Joe and I said, you know, public speaking is one of those things that I find to be very experiential. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to say to someone who's just listening right now on the podcast, okay, here are the three things you have to do because Joe, for all intents and purposes, doesn't know what you do, how you speak, who your audience is or anything like that. And so I just had this crazy idea. I said, listen, I would love that feedback. And I think if I sent you a clip, you can obviously watch that clip and then kind of go through it and maybe in giving me coaching, you guys call kind of learn along with me. So that's what we're going to do today. I know it's something that uh, is very different. We, I don't think Joe's done that on podcast before. So I'm excited to see where this goes. Yep. I'm excited to learn right along with you. So Joe, yeah, wherever you want to start, I I'm ready. I'm all yours. So, yeah. So the, originally everything I did started off in that world of working with people who wanted to become speakers. Now, this was the early 2000s, to give you an idea. And I also took, by the way, the same skill set into corporations uh, mm. from up until about 2013. I don't do a lot of corporate stuff anymore. I worked specifically in very high stakes proposals. So where there was going to be a presentation to win, say, a, a billion, five billion, ten billion dollar contract, aerospace contract. Small. That, I, Small. Yeah, exactly. Small. Little ones. Okay. Um, you know, we had an 85% win rate in that business and, uh, it was a ball to do for some reason. I jive really well with aerospace engineers. I don't know why I just do. It's a weird, you know, skill. I didn't know I had, I don't come from that kind of background as you can probably tell. So, um, you know, that was really the, the speaking side of what we did. And as we move forward now to be relevant into 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2018, is, uh, you know, I work with people who are in the business of making an impact mm. in others' lives. That's really the business, business I consider myself to be in the impact industry. For those who have some sort of calling, some sort of mission, some sort of thing that, you know, is a, a message or a, a skill set that they have, some sort of unique yeah. Talent, skill, ability. You're exactly right. You know, if you go through the normal courses like that, that for instance, teach you, you know, stand this way, gesture that way, introduce yourself this other way. Everybody comes out looking like a robot or an automaton. You know, oh, what I work with, I try to find the unique spark in each individual and say, okay, let's build on that. Sure, let's, you know, let's polish off some rough edges if you have some, sure. Let's help you handle that you know, stage fright if somebody has that or that anxiety so it's not immobilizing. But a certain amount of that energy is always gonna be your edge to get you up right before a performance as well, right? Yep. So um, you know, there's, there's that side of everything. So um, you know, the real key Though to, to the biggest takeaway, I would say for people in the realm of if they're in the impact business and they're going to be communicating a story, a message, a knowledge, a wisdom, a genius, dare I say, is to remember it's not about the words. You mm. know, people don't remember what we say. What they take away is how we made them feel. So it's all about the emotion we stir up, the emotion we invoke, the, the emotion that moves someone to do something differently as a result of the time that we spent together. That's the name of the game. That's what I work with people on. Beautiful. Yeah. It, you just, as you were saying that, I was thinking every movie that people are madly connected to, we were even talking about Big Lebowski right before yeah. I even said yeah. the first time I watched it, it was, 
it was mind bending because it was so different than anything else. And I truly couldn't even appreciate what I was watching until I even saw it the second time. And then, yeah. you know, like the emotional connection we were talking about, there's these sweaters that you said were some unique and people were buying $5,000 because yeah. it was yeah. with that movie. You know, the, the best teachers I've ever had, the best speakers, the best movies, the best books, everything always comes down to not how it was written, not how it was said. It was how it made me feel yep. and how it made me feel in the longer run, not just in the moment, but like, did that alter something in my life whereby maybe not that exact feeling, but that feeling created another momentum and created more feelings. And you just always kind of string it back to that speaker. Absolutely. Whatever. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the scales I measure, the effectiveness of someone who's in the impact business upon are the scales of how much do you move a person emotionally so that they do something differently? Mm. You know, there's real world, like, you know, feet on the street. Something is different as a result of the time that they've spent with you. Uh, this is not about getting up and just getting through a presentation. You know, as you, we talked when we talked before, as you pointed out, you know, I don't want to just give the three to five, you said, I believe, you know, tips for being a better speaker. I'm in total agreement. You know, just getting through something and keeping your job in the process. Well, I guess some people that's their goal, right? But uh, those of us that like make a living slash do it because it's our calling, mm -hmm. we do, you know, the end result, the measurement of our success is how much a person does things differently as a result. So that's, yeah. that's the whole name of the game and everything that, uh, that, that we do. And uh, those, you know, the clips that you sent me, I know we're going to get to that, but you've got so many amazing seeds and pearls of stuff that you do well, that, you know, when you really leverage that, go all in on those skills, that's going to be your, um, that's your, that's your, that's your meal ticket, so to speak. Thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. It's funny. And I, I don't say that to blow smoke. Uh, we'll get, when I start talking about my coaching model, one of the things I work with is here's your strengths. And we build on that. Cause here's my belief. We can only build on our strengths. We can't build on our failures, our weaknesses. So true. You know what I mean? So, so true. you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw smoke at you. What I'm trying to do is, you know, build on what truly and, you know, uh, honestly is a, a strength that you have. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's funny. It took me, I play tennis, not competitively for money or anything like that, but just it's one of those things that I'm absolutely passionately obsessed with. Yeah. I play, I mean, I live in the Northeast, so I have a few months where I can't, but in the months that it's nice, I'll play anywhere from minimum three to upwards of six times a week. So yep. I take it very seriously. Like today I was out in the morning with a tennis ball machine just by myself, right? So it took me about, when I, when I actually started getting training, I went through probably like a dozen or so coaches till I landed on this one guy in Naples, Florida. And this is funny, like how do I remember that it was one guy, I don't remember his name, but like one guy in Naples, Florida, right? I go and I take a lesson and he says to me, he goes, most coaches do this. They work on your weaknesses. They look at what your weakest shot is. And then you work on that. This guy was like, we're going to work on your forehand. And I'm like, why would we work on my forehand? He goes, that's clearly your weapon. Yeah. Why don't we give you more ways to use that weapon and from anywhere on the court? And I remember just stopping and thinking for a second, I'm like, wow. It just, it was mind blowing to me. And then ever since that, it really has been about, even with, with me, when I coach people, I'm always like, there's a way to show someone what they're really, really excellent at, like mindsets, yes. right? There's yes. a way that people process things or go through things. Some people are feelers. Some people are thinkers. Some people uh, can, can flip a script really quick. Like getting them to just notice that and use it is, is so much better than, okay, let me tell you all the ways that you suck and let's try to fix those, which is doable. It's just a much longer process and you're working on something that might not help you in the long run. Yeah, it is. I mean, I really think that whole notion of let's fix something in, inside of a person um, kind of comes from an old, you know, industrial age, mechanistic view of the world, mm -hmm. which is kind of like with a car. If my, you know, the carburetor, for lack of a better term, on, on the car is not working. 
you replace the carburetor, you fix the carburetor. Humans are not machines. <laughs> you know, humans are, are in, like infinitely open and, and complex and, you know, wild creatures that what you'll find is very much what you're saying. And that is, you know, if you just really get into those strengths and you own them, the deepest part of your soul, and you really then blow that out and you really go all in, all hands on deck on those strengths, mm. a lot of the mistakes that a person would make, just they completely float away. Yeah. You know, when you get them into, into flow state or to groove, all those little things they were doing when they were nervous or self-conscious or this or that, those things just go away. Yeah. So, and yet that's most of what the training in this arena has been historically designed to do, has been historically designed to overcome those, you know, those little mistakes and things like that. And that's, that's, that's small change. You know, that's playing for small stakes. Yeah. So good. I love that. Yeah. There's just something so beautiful about someone you said owning, like yeah. someone owning who they are. Yes. One of my earliest mentors he, you know, he was this kid from Brooklyn, he came from nothing, really just did amazing work, went, went, became, became a dentist, four practices later, head of uh, some dentistry, huge thing, whatever. So he's training on this class and he said flat out, he's like, look, I'm an asshole. And I'm also the most generous, loving human being. And it was, I remember just going like, why would you say that you're an asshole? But there's something beautiful in owning that. And I've, yeah. I've met people who they have a quirky laugh or they say words a funny way. For me in that, in that video, which you guys won't see, but there's a really funny part. Well, to me, funny. And I found other people found it really endearing. I suck at spelling. Like I'm an immigrant. I have chicken scratch handwriting and I suck <laughs> at spelling. And no, here, here's the thing, dude. It's a really uncreative person who can't spell a word like three or four different ways. <laughs> That's I'm use super, that going super forward. uncreative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Please do use it. I'm so the same way. I'm, I'm up on the board and I'm writing and, you know, I'm in front of, I don't know, there's probably like 300 or so people in the audience and I'm, I'm about to write and the word behavior comes up, which is a word that I've probably read like a million times, but you know, you have like that moment and I'm just like, all right, guys, check it out. I suck at spelling. So... If I misspell a word, just deal with it. Go with like the big picture here. A guy came up to me afterwards. He goes, man, when you did that thing at the board, that was life changing for me. I'm like, what? What did I do? He said, when you said you can't spell. I was like, oh, okay. He goes, I give so many presentations and I freeze when I have to write stuff because I'm so afraid I'm going to make a mistake. Yeah. And what you gave me and just allowing myself to be and the way you did it was just funny and and like no one cared anymore. And I was like, yeah, you just own it. Yep. 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 I having grown up with uh, dyslexia, you know, that's, that is a common thing. Mm. And so I just years ago, I remember I thought, well, hell it's, it's, I mean, it's super uncreative to not be able to spell a word a couple of different ways. So <laughs> what the hell? We're just going to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> and English, you know, I have two young kids, so now they're learning to spell. And as I was asking me things to spell, I'm like, uh, Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, sweetheart, I'll help you spell that yeah, word. Hang on one second. He's yeah. so much better at spelling already. I'm like, this is Yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, so we want to dive in? Let's do it. Okay. I'm all yours. Tell all me right. Some so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a couple of things. Uh, again, the way I work with people is, let me give you the frame of that, first of all. Yep. Uh, first and foremost, I look at what you do well, what are strengths, what can you build upon. That is first. Beautiful. Secondarily, we look at what are some ideas for improvement? Some things you may want to consider, you may want to polish off, you may want to tighten up. Here, here's the big frame on all of this. I already said that, you know, you can't build on your uh, failures, only your strengths. That's one of the places that I come from. Another place that I come from, though, is any of the things that typically, as we just talked about, would be called weaknesses or mistakes that a person makes the simple fact is in public communication uh, uh, events, um, you know, circumstances, there's not really anything that's a mistake except for one thing. There's one thing that you cannot recover from. Everything else, as long as it's not distracting or more importantly, as long as it doesn't create a breaking connection, 
mm. with your audience. So for instance, let's, let's take the spelling thing. You know, if a person is real like uptight and they get freaked out and they break connection, it breaks connection with them to misspell a word a certain way, then, then that's, an, that's an issue. We got to work on that. Mm. Just deframing the whole spelling thing by saying, look, I, you know, this is not my, my high point. You get, the, you, know, you get the idea and so forth. It allows connection to still happen in the face of something that typically would be a little small thing a person would work on. Same thing applies for different eye contact patterns. Same thing applies for messaging in general. Same thing applies, frankly, for language. You know, there is some places where some crowds where it is not appropriate, no matter what your, you know, habits of language might be to throw down, you know, F this, F that. Yeah. And you may do it because it's authentically who you are and you can come from that posi position and so forth. Cool. But if it's going to cause a breaking connection with your audience, the real question is, are you as effective as you could be? It's not about being right. It's about being effective in this world, yep. as the old cliche goes, right? So um, with you, a couple of things. Let's talk well, about what you do you really like, up front. a very big open loop that I want to come back to. Yeah, yeah. You, said you, don't, there's, you can recover from anything except for one except thing. Except for one thing, right. Shall I give it to you? Yeah. Or you want me to give it later? Because you don't do it. So... Here's the one thing that our audience will not forgive that I've found over the, over all my years of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people leading through events and so forth, teaching tens of thousands, arrogance, mm. cockiness, overconfidence, talking mm. down, superiority, talking down at your audience, um, uh, kind of a, 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 a no fault attitude on your part is going to cause people to try to find chinks in that armor, mm. that cockiness, that arrogance. And that, you know, we're all, those of us that are, you know, uh, are relatively self-confident people, you know, you can come off at times as being big and having a big personality without being overly confident arrogant and cocky in the face of, uh, uh, of the, the, the audience that you're there to serve. I really consider the person at the front of the room is there to serve the audience, not the other way around, yep. which that in and of itself was one of the biggest things when I started speaking on the professional circuit. And I, you know, I realized some of the people that were up there kind of had it mixed up. You know, they were doing it the other way around. We're there to serve them. And so if I need to adjust my style, let's just say that, you know, and I, I am, I, you know, I can, I can be very uh, 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 generous, shall we say, with the F word when I'm in my normal everyday conversations and I'm passionate about something. Yet, if it's not appropriate in a given situation, then I'm not going to impose my style on that situation. I'm going to get the result. Interesting. And so that's one of the things that, that is to come back to your, your one thing. Your one thing that our audience won't forgive you for is, in a sense, you know, I've never quite put it this way before, but you're making me think about it. Um, demanding that they come into your world as opposed to stepping into their world. Meaning if I'm overly confident, arrogant, everything else, just because that's quote unquote who I am and I'm going to throw it against the wall and see how that works as opposed to being more committed to the result of the audience actually changing something and adding that value and adjusting my style to fit that outcome, um, that arrogance, that cockiness, that's the one thing. They won't let you get away with it. Now, for you, a couple of things. Number one, you have great presence uh, on stage. Again, I'm not saying this to blow smoke. I'm saying this as a place to build from. You have really great presence. One of the things I noticed about you is that most people um, – are not comfortable with, but you are, are pauses on stage, some silence here and there. Uh, you, again, you don't want to overuse anything. So even these things that I'm telling you that are, you know, strengths, you don't want to overuse them because then they'll become a weakness. They'll yep. become a rub. They'll break connection with your audience, but you're great with your pauses. You want to use those judiciously is the best way to put it but you're comfortable with them. They're not awkward. Some people, when they stop talking, you know, things get real awkward real quickly. You're very, you're very centered. Your presence is, 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 is very much uh, one that is comfortable with, with pauses and silences and letting points land. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like really letting that land. Yeah. And thank, then, thank you, comedians. And yes, yes, yes. You do that really well. And I was trying to draw that out a little bit by pausing myself. Yep. So great, 
great job on that. Um, you have also really great language patterns, naturally. Um, I'm, I'm guessing at some point you probably studied. Uh, you have a background like NLP, stuff like that, right? Yeah, right. So your language patterns are coming out, I think, even sometimes unconsciously when you don't yep. even realize they're coming out. That's the most effective way to use them. Uh, you know, people who set up, you know, these conscious language patterns to get an audience to comply or to quote unquote influence their audience and so forth. Here's what I believe. You know, as we sit here, I'll date this, this uh, podcast by doing this, but as we sit here in 2018, audience, audiences are so effing on it. Like, no. they, they, there is not room for that old school shit that worked in the 1980s, 1990s. Totally. If you're out there still trying to peddle, like, you know, uh, hypnotism this and embedded commands that, which, by the way, I'm well trained in and I'm a big fan of where it's appropriate to get the change. I am not a fan from the standpoint, obviously, of manipulation, as some people use it. But more importantly, audiences are on to us. They yep. know it. They get it. They see, they've seen it before. So not overusing that. You have very natural, unconscious language patterns that also happen to facilitate, you know, your, your audience deciding to make a change as part of what's going on. So great. Um, that's a great thing to build upon. Your bigger message as a whole. I'm trying to think of, you sent me a couple of videos. The one video... Uh, the, the one thing that really struck me was the point that you made about, you know, that everything that we're doing from personal development, spiritual development, you know, any kind of development work is to get us back to where we were as children. That was beautiful, dude. That was beautiful. I, 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 I know we can't show the clip here. If people have a chance to come and see you speak sometime when you're speaking on that, do it. Because Thanks. that was beautiful. That was, that was really I mean, I've, I, you know, I've, I've, I guess I've known that notion before in the back of my mind. It, by the way, these are the most powerful things anyone can do as a speaker is when a person, meaning me, on the receiving end watches it and goes, wow, I've kind of had that in the back of my mind, but oh, they just put words to it. Yeah. You know, Einstein or whoever it was, I can't remember if it was Einstein or um, uh, 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 um, Edison, who said that the greatest ideas are always the most simple ones, the most basic ones, the, mo the ones that you just say, oh yeah, huh. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course we do it that way. That's kind of the way that, uh, you know, that, that example was in mm. what you're doing. is super powerful. It landed really well with the audience as well. I'm, I can, it looks to me like from the back of the room, but yeah. a pretty, <laughs> pretty advanced guess here. It, it landed really well too, correct? Yeah. 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 I mean, I heard people like make comments and say, woohoo, you know, yeah. off, off mic and everything. Great, great job on all that. Um, ballsy ballsy to coach from stage. I'm a fan of that, man. I'm a fan of you throwing it out there because here's what it is. You know, the, 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 the biggest misnomer of presentation skills and so forth is that we're up there to talk at a group. Yeah. We're not, we're there having a conversation with the individuals. And in that case, specifically, you were having a specific kind of conversation with one person. Now, one thing you did really well, again, I want to, I want to call it out because I want you to build on it. Yeah, please. Is in your work with that one person, though, you made it apply to the whole room. That is a, that's a top tier skill. And people who are presenters, when you're answering questions, when you're back and forth with any one individual from an audience, the skill of being able to have a mind, a track in your mind of saying, okay, how can I make this apply to the entire room? Mm. Or how can I go back and speak to a few people specifically that need to hear this message? I will cloak it in that I'm talking to Jim, but it's actually meant for Bill or mm. Mary or Susan. Do you follow me on that? Absolutely. That's and great. I can see that you were doing it somewhat consciously as well. Great job. Great awesome. job on that, having a breadth of application to even one-on-one -on -one conversations. Ballsy, as I said. Um, I loved also your point, and I'll, I'll end on this, for what you did well. Um, I loved your point about gratitude and love. Uh, do you remember that? Like when you said, you know, if you really want to get back, or you want to you make your, your business really matter, or something like that, or you want to get really clear on why you're doing your business, like when the times are hard, when you're starting it up and everything's not going your way and so forth, get back to gratitude and love, you said. I yep. believe that was the context. Yep. Beautiful. Beautifully done. Thanks. Bring it back to one simple point for everybody as a takeaway here. Have one outcome, mm. one takeaway. And quite frankly, 
you know, gratitude and love, but gratitude is one takeaway that if you go back there uh, from everything that a person does as part of a presentation, it's one of those safe takeaways that <laughs> will always be meaningful and, and no amount of us hearing it can ever remind us to be enough of it. Yeah, it's just so a great reminder on going. It is. It is. Okay, so ideas for improvement. Here, here they are. Number one. So I'm going to start with technical and then I'm going to go a bit more broad. Uh, parallel gesturing. Watch out for parallel gesturing. Now, I'm, I'm showing you what it is right now as I do it. Yeah. A certain amount of parallel gesturing is totally fine. It's as though there's a mirror between the two halves of your body. Okay. Everything ends up being the exact same way. It's both hands, both sides of the body become a mirror to each other. That sort of parallel gesturing, just use it judiciously. Interesting. Use it sometimes, not all the time. Don't make that your only go-to because otherwise you're like, um, uh, what was his name? John Madden, right? So like, he got the ball. He ran down the field. He did this. He did that. Holy smokes. <laughs> so just chill out. You know, use both laterally, both halves of your body. But a certain amount of parallel gesturing is absolutely useful. You want to do it. Let me be clear. You just don't want to overuse it to the point that it's the only tool in your toolbox. So let me ask this. That's a great. I've, I've never heard that, which I yeah. love and thank you. Sure. Is there a time where is there some, is that used to accentuate something? Is there absolutely. a time when it's used for something? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not thinking of a specific time off the top. I mean, it obviously, anything you're trying to illustrate like, you know, it was this big, obviously that's going to be a bit more powerful than it was this big this or that, mm. right? So you're going to use parallel gesturing automatically to a, a, a certain extent. There's no doubt about it. You just want to be aware of it and not overuse it. I'll tell you another thing this is like. This is similar to, I don't know if the story is completely accurate. Of, it's just the way I heard it. But, I, I, you know, there's people who point at audiences, yeah. right? It is societally fairly unacceptable to point at people. That's a very, un yet a lot of, for instance, politicians do it. I heard a story one time, and I don't have verification on this, but it sounds basically kind of right, <laughs> uh, that you know, Bill Clinton, when he was early on, he was working with some sp uh, speaking coaches, and he was a pointer. He did a lot of pointing. And they physically taped his finger back for a period of time because he still makes that same gesture. We're all used to it. We've all seen it. And it's only been the difference of curling that back. So part of parallel gesturing is so you don't do it too much is you make the same gesture and you just shut down one half of your body as you do it. And then you move to the other. And it gives just a breadth and it gives some uh, variety Interesting. to your body language. Uh, you also... One thing that you do from a body language standpoint, standpoint very well, facial gesturing is one of the biggest tools any of us can use. It's, you know, there's an old joke, corny joke, that it's the biggest area of unemployment for most people, you know, in their body, <laughs> that they're facial gesturing, but um, you do a really great job of that. The other thing you do really well is upper body gesturing. So shoulders, upper body, it opens up your chest cavity. It gets one breathing when one presents, you know, yeah. as a takeaway for some people watching this. Just start getting more of your upper body and your face and your gesturing. And even if you have to stand behind a podium, you still can be effective and be a very animated yeah. presenter in doing it uh, like that. Um, one thing I'd watch out for you, uh, for with you, and it's not uncommon. A lot of people, when it's there, do it leaning on a podium so if there's a podium there just kind of saddling up and you know leaning in like this yeah um, you know it's just it's there so we have a tendency to do it unless we consciously it's okay to do it every now and then it's not okay to do it too much because think of what happens when you do that on the heels of me talking about facial gesturing upper body gesturing and so forth you shut all that down right yep. So if you're going to use it, and there is a time and a place to use it, for instance, when you're going to pause and you're going to let, let something land, you might utilize it there. Because this, this roller coaster ride of, of, of speed and intensity to our presentations versus silence and being okay with slowing down and things like that, that roller coaster 
enhances the emotional ride yeah. that people take with you. And so great, you know, you do a really great job of that. Just be careful. You don't, you know, lean on that podium too much because it can become a bit of a crutch, yeah. you know, pun intended, um, as you know, if, if, if one overuses it be, um, because you're there. Um, one other thing for you to watch out for, I would say, just as an idea for improvement, be careful with the idle pacing back and forth. This is a very common thing. I also tried to look, um, Elon, for things that a lot of people do. This is one a lot of some, some people will do. Not everyone. Some people just plant and they never move. And that becomes its own issue. I got to get them moving. Yeah. Here's the key. Movement with purpose. Move, take a couple of steps, and then plant and land that point. Got it. And then move a bit more and land the point. I'd rather you move, if I were working with you, I'd rather you move than not. Uh, sometimes people who are really, really rigid and planted, it's really difficult for them to ever pick up a, 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 an unconscious way of moving yeah. that is with purpose. You being one who moves quite a bit, just start bringing to mind, how do I want this to serve the moment? And move with purpose and plant when it's time to plant. Beautiful. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? What's that? Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Please do. Go ahead. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I watched it back, I actually wrote that comment for myself. Oh, interesting. That I just noticed that I went back and forth. Now it wasn't, I've seen people where they literally just pace back and there's no yes. pause. They just yes. turn, <laughs> you know, it's back and forth. You no, know, I call it the college professor because it's what we think of as a college professor, just kind of like pacing and pontificating. Yeah. So I definitely wrote that where I think unconsciously subconsciously I do it from because I was actually trying to think about it is engaging the entire audience so yes. that specific room had you know a right side and a left side and the room was very wide yes I saw. Was also very wide yep and so I was, I was like why do I do that I think it was because I was trying to be with all sides of the room yeah totally fine you want to do that yeah you want to be with all sides of the room while keeping in mind movement with purpose. Move, yeah. plant, make your point, speak to that side of the audience, move back, stop, make your point, plant. Got it. And then when it comes time, move again. You've got, got those side to side movements. You've also got forward and back movements, which you did not necessarily use quite as consciously as you did your side to sides, yeah. right? So that's real straightforward. Step into your point, and then step back when you're digressing. That's like the key that. to, to that type of movement. But yeah. all in all, just movement with purpose, dude. Um, that's the most important thing. But you know, that all being said, you know, again, let's build on what you did well. Your message is great. You've got you know, several things that really hit like to the heart of the audience. It wasn't a bunch of just um, hyperbole and hype. It yeah. was a very meaningful, you know, talk that you gave as, as, as well. And, um, but, and, and I really think it's important, you know, having that, having that simplicity of outcome where you've got one or two things that a person could take away. And if nothing else, they take away, you know, <laughs> he was all about gratitude and love, or he was all about really reminding me to get back to that childlike nature and not childish, childlike nature that lives inside of all of us, that is the reason for, as you said, the reason for a lot of our work that we do as adults is to unlearn yeah. certain things. And yeah. so, you know, those are key kind of takeaway outcome points that um, really should drive everything within a presentation. Beautiful. Everything that, that I do is always driven by outcome, not words. Super valuable. Strong enough outcome, you'll figure out the words, man. Beautiful. I have a couple of questions. Uh, was there anything else, first of all? No, no. That's, that's okay. basically it. Beautiful. So I know in personal uh, experience, and I also know from speaking to other speakers, that it's much easier to present for an hour than it is for 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for those you know, when you want to make a 10, 15 minute presentation really, really hit home. Yep. 
I know obviously it probably focuses on, you know, simplicity of message, one, one thing that you want to deliver. Yep. Are there any other things that you train people on to, to do that? Yes, absolutely. You are a hundred percent right. The, you know, that for lack of a better term, we'll call it a Ted style. Yes. Presentation. So whether it's for the, you know, Ted, TEDx organization, or a lot of conferences are going to Ted style presentations now. So let's just call it what it is. Right. So, um, key with one of those, number one, one big idea, as you said, that's all one story, basically. Usually TEDs are very uh, visually driven as well as far as your, you know, your slides and, and things like that. But here's the thing to remember with, with a short presentation, because you're exactly right. The preparation for one of those is much more exhaustive. If you want to nail it, it's going to be much more exhaustive than a, even a longer hour long or two hour long or day long uh, you know, workshop type environment. In a TED type presentation, a 10 or a 15 minute presentation, here's my rule of thumb. I would probably plan on working on it, dry running it and dress rehearsing it for a minimum of 20 hours to get it right. Wow. Yeah. Um, I've had clients go routinely 50 to 90. One guy rehearsed for 90 hours for a 12 minute TED. Wow. Um, yeah, but he nailed it. When it came down to it, he nailed it. Now, there's a certain amount of that that you're going to go through, depending on the conference, with the organizers, where you're actually going to go in and do a, you know, a series of dress rehearsals or dry runs, actually they are, in front of the, uh, like the board, you know, their committee, and they'll give you feedback and say, do this, do that. So there's a certain amount of that time that you have to factor into everything. But, you know, as a rule of thumb, you're probably going to spend for a really solid, I mean, you know, 10-minute presentations are interesting because both the Gettysburg Address and the, the Sermon on the Mount were less than 10 minutes. So you can really, really like have some punch in that amount of time. But it's one of the reasons you want to take it so seriously and you so want to prepare for it. Now, here's the key. You want to dry run it. You want to dress rehearse it several, to obviously quite a few times in advance. But you don't want to do it so much that you're stale. Mm. Video every rehearsal that you do and watch yourself back without uh, exception. Um, you will pick up little things. each iteration that you go through of rehearsal, you'll be working on a few things. The first time you rehearse, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be clunky. I call it a stumble through rather than a walk through really. Um, and, and, and no, you're going to make all kinds of mistakes, but you're only looking to be like 20% there. The second time you're only looking to be 30, 40% done. The third time you're only looking to be 40, 60% done. And you know, up to about, I find six to eight, times of saying something, doing something, giving a presentation, over that you're going to become stale. So you got to be hypersensitive as well to where you become stale. And you sound like a tape recording, you know, or an audio recording where a person just press play and the words come out of your mouth exactly yeah. that same way. So be careful. Walk that line. Six, eight times with adjustments, uh, watching yourself back on video, all of those things. 10, 15 minute presentation, you do it that many times with watching yourself back and adjustments to your presentation, you're gonna be that 15, 20 hours, something like that minimum. Wow. Do you recommend that people write out the entire script or do you tell them to write out bullet points and just kind of see what comes out and then build off of that? Work on bullet points. If you're going to script anything, script the opening 20, 30 seconds and the closing 20, 30 seconds. You know, study that was done um, in the 1970s show that, you know, audiences uh, uh, make judgments. They decide who a speaker is within the opening seven seconds of them giving a presentation. So you want to know that cold. But then, you know, on the back end, your call to action. I mean, the biggest thing most people do, especially if they're, you know, pressed for time, is they sacrifice their clothes. Rookie mistake. Because that is the single, probably most important part of the entire presentation. Hmm. Never sacrifice your clothes. Always have a you know, strong, strong call to action out of what you're doing. You know, a takeaway, something people can really roll with, but do not sacrifice that clothes and its power because that's, the, that's that pivotal moment. Just because you're over time, don't let it go. So, so with that being said, is there, do you have certain tips for people when it comes to closing a presentation because that's true sometimes most of the time speakers running over 
they're, you know, flashing the cards in the back. You're like, yep. uh, uh, so what, what would be some good tips around that? Well, I mean, obviously, as you find yourself during the presentation, you realize you, you've gone a little over or you need to, you know, tighten it up, tighten up then. Don't mm. wait until the end because you'll regret that you waited so long. Don't procrastinate tight, tightening it up. Cut out during the presentation. Uh, so the final, so to answer your question, in the close, close is going to usually come down to a couple of things. Number one, if you're taking questions and answers, let's just address that. That's going to happen prior to your final close. Again, rookie mistake a lot of people make. They do their entire presentation, do the close, and then they stand there and say, now, any questions? A presentation is building what I call a path to certainty. Hmm. You are building more and more deeper certainty within your audience. And you want to hit the pinnacle right at the close. Questions and answers by their nature are going to kind of juggle that certainty a little bit. They're going to they're gonna play with it. So don't do that after you're done. Do that before your final close. Final close, just have it be some sort of maybe wrap up of the key points you made and then some sort of call to action, you know? So I, so I ask you now, or so I challenge you, or, you know, um, so I, I implore you, do this, do that, and then have a specific call to action of something you want people to do as a result of the time they've spent with you. So if this were us right now, you know, my call to action could be, so here's what I encourage everybody to do. Your next presentation, next presentation, decide in advance what your outcome is and be driven by that outcome and let the words come to you. Don't get hung up on the words, know the outcome clearly. And then rehearse and know cold your opening and your close. Those are the things I encourage your audience to do, right? So that becomes your call to action even out of a conversation like this. Yeah, so good. You know, it's so funny. I notice uh, my resistance to authority from a very, very young age. And then in speaking, one of the things that I most, most dislike about certain people is, you know, scripted, slideshow, do this, do that, et cetera. And it's funny that I'm listening. Uh, obviously you're beyond expert at this and not that I'm judging, just the noticing the sensations in my body as you're saying this, and I know it to be true. And it's like the, the little voice inside is going, you're not fucking doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, any tips that I give people, what we usually then immediately do is they try them out. They try them on. Yeah. And we make adjustments, you know, based on that. Um, you know, there are some, uh, there, there are no hard and fast rules, though. I have seen, as you can imagine, I have seen people get away with shit that you would never imagine they could get away with, but because of their style, their personality, they could. And I've seen others that tried to get away with things, right? And their style didn't work. I mean, as, as we talked about, like language, for instance, I know it's become really like in vogue and, and, and cool to drop the F, F this, F that. And again, I say that in my everyday languaging, don't get me wrong. I am not a, you know, I'm not a, 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 a nun. <laughs> I'm not a you know choir boy here, but there are times and places where just saying it for because it's my style may or may not serve, may or may not serve. So just I, take all that into account. I learned that actually. I was asked to speak in D.C. in front of a group of state lobbyists mm -hmm. because one of the girls that was organizing it was obsessed with my podcast, and um, she had invited me. And the woman who actually fronted the bill to pay for my speaker fee. I was telling a story about how I found this out afterwards. Obviously I was telling a story about how my girlfriend post college broke up with me and this whole story about um, how, when you reprogram things like the way you look at the way you look at things change when you've reprogrammed it. And at some point I said, you know, she really hurt me. And I was like, you bitch, you like my, the thought in my head was like, you bitch, you ruined, you ripped the heart out of my chest, something like that and kept going and, you know, didn't think anything of it. And afterwards that woman went up to the girl that invited me and basically didn't ream her out, but was basically like super upset that I used that word. Right. I was like, wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and you know, those, the, our ability, your latitude with doing stuff like that as well, all of us as, as speakers, as leaders, I mean, that's what we are for, you know, for the period of time we're given, I consider that we are the leaders of that group for that period of time. Yeah. So under then, if you look at your, your role as one of leadership, a couple of things come into play. You know, there, are, you know, 10 years ago, it was okay to say stuff on stage that it is not in 2018, right? Mm. And so part of what you also have to stay very attuned to and very up with are everything from like, you know, current events and, and, and things like that, you know, news. I know some people are like, I never watch the news, CNN, constantly negative news and this and that and so forth. I don't subscribe to those. I think you actually, as a leader, should stay well-versed um, in certain things. But one of the things to stay sensitive to is that, you know, our words do pack a punch. They do pack a power. And just because a word, I have a friend, really good friend. This is a great example. I have a really, really close friend. He's an amazing, amazing speaker. And off stage, it's F this, F that, F this. And he's funny and he can get away with it and all that. He made a decision about 10 years ago to take all the energy because when, you know, when he was asked about why do you use that word, he would say, well, it gives me an energy. It gives me a juice. I need in that moment. And he said, you know, that's lazy. You know, when I was growing up, this is just me personally. When I was growing up, my father always said, vulgarity is the sign of a lazy mind. Hmm. And I think there's some truth to that. Honestly, I find with myself, if I ever get kind of lazy in my languaging, those things can tend to come out. And this guy said, you know, I'm not going to be lazy about it. Instead, I'm just going to reprogram myself to say frickin' with the same tonality, the same energy, and pull the same emotion out of me in that moment. But just that little change, it's not going to be as offensive uh, to people. He made that change, and his career reflected what happened after that. Wow. He just soared. So, you know, just little things like that, you know, it's, it's a big game. <laughs> it's a high level game, being a great communicator publicly. Yeah, big time. And I think that really being outstanding with it through time is also a game of the small chess pieces as well. Beautiful. Joe, I, uh, I personally can't thank you enough because it was just really, really beautiful and uh, took away some mega nuggets here that I will definitely be working on, not only on stage, but just in, in everyday life. I actually think public speaking is one of the greatest gifts it is. that any person can learn. Even if you don't speak on stage, we are constantly immersed with other people. Life is a relationship game. So yeah. for me, being able to even at a dinner, know how I'm communicating, how to hold my body, how to, how to say certain things or not say certain things, the pauses, the listening, all of it has made such a huge difference and yeah. how comfortable I am to walk into any room and, and own myself, not have all that chatter. So I, I've sent friends to public speaking courses that have nothing to, they don't even, they're not interested in public speaking. It was just more of to get them out of their own head when they were in public situations, they had the awkwardness or they yep. felt shy or, and I just said, it's just because you're unaware of how you carry yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And the second you see that it's massive. So yeah, I'm a huge, huge proponent of this for anyone, not just those that are actually going to speak on stage. Um, so thank you for, for sharing your gold with us here and me personally. And for those who are listening, where can they find out more about you and how to join your programs? Sure thing. They can go to uh, joewilliamsonline.com. And uh, joewilliamsonline.com. I'll say it a little more slowly. And yeah, you can find out there about our programs and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, I work pretty intimately uh, with people. I don't do massive events where I stand on stage and, you know, talk at people as we talked about how to speak. Um, it is very much something I work very intensively with people on. And if it's a fit, if it's something a person would like to pursue, I'd love to help them out if I, if I can. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for being here with us and taking your time out of your busy day, I'm sure. Yep. And uh, for all you else who are listening, please let us know how this landed for you. I'd love to hear and I'm sure Joe would as well. And until next time, have an amazing, amazing day, my friends.